All right, so, hello, my name is Bilal. Uh, I think half of you guys probably already know me, and that's not saying much because we're in a very intimate setting. Actually, I'm probably going to rush through the slides because most of the people here already know a little bit about my background and some of the work that I've done. And I'm going to go through the slides for the benefit of the people streaming and of uh, the new friendly faces. Hello. And um, after that, I hope that we can begin a conversation about this topic, about good is hard. Uh, show of hands on the internet, how many people here want to use their lives and their work to do something they consider good? One, two, oh, most people. Okay, yeah, me too. Um, because I guess when I was younger, I get a lot of the motivation and drive was to be successful. And the success was externally motivated and designed as an image of success that didn't really appeal to me. And so as I was growing up, I was trying to figure out who am I and what do I have to offer? And so this is going to be a brief uh, set of shots about some of those questions that I've asked. Oh yeah, also, somebody told me if I was going to talk about good is hard, I had to talk about Eek the Cat. And to be honest, I don't know Eek the Cat. But who here does? Anybody? Okay, the camera guy knows he's Eek the Cat, and I bet you a lot of the people streaming know Eek the Cat because Eek the Cat is a television superstar. And uh, one of his lines, one of his quotes is, it can't hurt to help. And he apparently goes out to try to help and then over and over repeatedly gets hurt trying to help. Uh, and so I didn't know I had a mascot, uh, but I'm, I was really glad to be talking with some of the Uber nerds here. And they're like, well, it's like totally Eek the Cat, man. I'm like, what are you talking about, Eek the Cat? And so I looked it up and apparently, uh, hi, my name is Eek. I have a problem. I'd like to help. And uh, so this uh, happened in 2012 when I had been doing hackerspace stuff in the States, trying to think about... Uh, I guess when the economy collapsed in my last year of college, I was wondering, uh, what do we do now, guys? Like, what are we going like, to take a job? Or there's no jobs. And, and then hackerspaces at the same time started elbowing, basically going from a couple dozen to hundreds and more uh, just in the States, uh, mostly because of the, the situation that we were in. There was no jobs, but there was a lot of tools in the market, and there was a lot of empty space. So space plus tools plus bored people equals potential for hackerspace breeding ground. It's like uh, a petri dish. And so America started blossoming, blooming, all sorts of multicolored, dyed-haired weirdos gathering together in the abandoned warehouses. And so I got really excited about this, and I did a little documentary tour. And then when the Arab Spring happened a couple of years later, I was like, oh, this is perfect. It's like the same sort of thing, a bunch of unemployed young people. And maybe it's, it's going to be that same sort of breeding ground now for the Middle East. And so this is me in Baghdad uh, doing a workshop with a bunch of LED throwies because the power kept cutting out. Uh, and that was the beginning of me trying to uh, share something that I thought was uh, beneficial. And of course, people were like, oh, you're bringing tools. Well, guess what? We have problems. And I was like, oh, wait, you can use tools to solve problems. And that was kind of the beginning of this. Because before this, I was really just a curious nerd who liked art <laughs> and making stuff. I, I was making laser cutters so I could do graffiti. That was, that was mostly what I was, what I was doing. But once I started going to the Middle East, and I was like, I got tools. And they were like, oh, great, because we got problems. I was like, oh, oh, it's like a match made in hell. And it was awesome. Uh, and so they were like, okay, so in the hospitals, there's no power. So how about you just do something to help us keep track of people's hearts while they're in hospitals? And I was like, you know what? Because I was terrified of Baghdad, I only booked a three-day ticket. This is not a three-day problem. So how about I give you the tools and then point you to Instructables or another website on the internet and you figure it out. And uh, I kind of did that. I gave him some stuff and then I posted something on Instructables, Instructables being like, I did this thing. I took a bunch of Arduinos into Baghdad and they got problems. And then amazingly enough, this is where something cool happened. This is why you need to share. Uh, my friend Mortada steps in on the comment section. I didn't know him back then. And he was like, hey, I'm probably the only guy in Iraq who knows about Arduinos. Like, connect them with me. And so I connected them with a bunch of doctors that had this problem with the power cutting out. And he made this uh, rapidly prototyped uh, sensor that they would take around in the hospitals. And then I was like, oh, okay, I was kind of on a roll. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, uh, le let me continue to move further into this thing. I was inspired because people kept um, encouraging this sort of work, being like, hey, you're like an activist now. Congratulations. You're not just like a geek who likes art. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm an activist now. I'm not just a geek who likes art. And I was like, why don't you like your 3D printing is the next cool thing that everyone wants to do cool stuff with, solve problems with it. And I was like, oh, great idea. And so I, I started thinking about um, how to use 3D printing to be good and to help. Uh, and 
one of my first ideas was uh, my my cousin who recently passed away um, has an amputated leg because of sanctions and because of not being able to get good diabetes medication or healthy food or because Iraq sucks, um, diabetes, diabetics often die. And so he did. But before he did, he lost his leg. And I thought maybe we can make him a more comfortable prosthetic socket because he was not moving a lot. And I thought if we can help him move with less pain, it would move his blood around and he could keep more of his toes on his other leg and so on and so forth. I was just trying to make the guy mobile. And so we... Uh, made a scan of his leg and we kept on going and I was using it to help build up the hackerspace community because back then in my head I was thinking oh you know what um, in, in, in the west a lot of the tools that people are using are to make like flame throwing unicorns and they take it out into the playa and this is sort of my experience in uh, San Francisco uh, and like Burning Man culture mixed with maker culture hacker culture in the bay and I thought you know maybe if we like started with projects that weren't blinky lights, started with people looking at open source and DIY tools as a way to adjust problems, it would begin this uh, path, uh, this culture. And you know, now that I think about it, this is totally, I'm thinking about it right now. It's like my own personal trajectory was because of curiosity and interest and, and play. And it wasn't about like go out and solve problems. But what I started doing was inspiring people to address an issue instead of inspiring people to think about what matters to them, at least back then. So I did a bunch of this stuff that I don't know quite so much about. And it was really great. And we uh, helped people connect with each other. Uh, that's uh, Saleh Zain over there, who is one of the co-founders of the hackerspace in Baghdad. He was like 16 at the time. He's wearing a noise bridge shirt. Um, it was my noise bridge shirt, by the way. It's not his noise bridge shirt. I want it back, Saleh, looking at you. Um, and so that was my experience in Baghdad. And I just kept doing these kinds of things. This is a quick uh, project that I did in the south of uh, Iraq with uh, Geiger counters. Because one day, after doing this work for some time, people started inviting me, being like, oh, you're like one of those technical people that is interested in NGO stuff. I'm like, I guess. Yeah, sure. And so I came to this talk, and they're like, here's some NGO people. Here are their problems. And uh, see what you can do. And I just literally just, just happened to have passed through the media lab and picked up one of these Geiger counters because I thought it was another interesting open source tool that could address challenges and could be an inspiration. So I brought it as just inspiration. And then somebody was like, yeah, so in uh, the country, in the part of the country where I'm from, there's a lot of depleted uranium and people are dying and kids are sick. And uh, that's my problem. That's like what I want to use my NGO uh, to, to address. And so I thought, hey, let's go to Basra and see if we can use these tools to identify if there's higher concentration of radiation because currently nobody is admitting that um, depleted uranium is a problem. Uh, it's still used in modern warfare. It's still considered a legal uh, type of ammo. And uh, they dumped tons and tons of it on Iraq. And they don't actually call it a toxic waste zone. Uh, but it is. At least uh, that's what it seems uh, from some of the research. OK. And then as I've been doing this for some time, more and more of these organizations started popping up, like the Global hum Humanitarian Lab, which is in Geneva. Uh, and some point, I basically there was a turning point in my life when <clears throat> I started doing prosthetics for uh, amputees uh, because 3D printing can make custom size shapes uh, and it was really a good application for prosthetics. And so I started getting interested in this and somebody invited me to LA to help work on some hands with him. But when I got there, this is when I started thinking about intentionality in a totally different way. Up until this point, I was just super excited and jazzed and trying to go from like one project to the next, just trying to get people excited about making, building, and creating these community spaces together. And then at that point, when I went to his house, and there was four television cameras, and then me as like the sole engineer and my friend that I just happened to bring with me, and uh, I realized that it was a giant TV show and that I was getting swept up in like this image uh, creation thing. And that's when I started thinking about this quote basically from Foucault, which is, uh, people know what they know. They frequently know why they do what they do, but you can never really know what the impacts of what you do uh, is going to be. So a really quick story. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was in Cairo with my dad, and my dad bought a piece of bread. And he gave uh, some homeless persons, a beggar basically, a piece of bread because they looked hungry and they were really appreciative. That inspired my dad uh, to buy a stack of bread and uh, to pass it out. And, and basically he started a riot where people were like ripping bread out of each other's hands and there was a, a fight in the street. And so my dad, in his kindness and his good-hearted nature, thought that he was doing something that was going to be helpful and beneficial. 
but in the end had some unintended consequences. And so um, basically this, uh, this is the graph of the world and why people do things. Um, this is a, a guiding star for many people and corporations is does this or does this not increase shareholder value? And I'm wondering what my guiding star was. So after a lot of these situations, as I was growing up, as I was going through these experiences, as I was pursuing my curiosity, as I was pursuing what I thought felt good and right to do, and then started getting uneasy about it, started wondering, like, what it, like, I want to at least get the two, the two bullet points from Foucault down, like, wh <laughs> what I'm doing, right? Like, I want to know, uh, and why, right? And so I tried to start understanding my own guiding star, and... Uh, one of the, uh, the two examples, actually, after I was in this state, and the person who actually gave me these two examples is sitting right over here. Hello, Queen. <laughs> I came up to Quinn one day and was like, oh my god, Quinn, I don't really know what's going on. I don't even know, like, um, good or bad or, or uh, you know, sometimes I'm wondering about if I'm kind of pursuing external validation or uh, accolades. And Quinn was like, just one second, I got two amazing stories for you. And so she gave me these really two great stories about people who um, succeeded at doing something good with their lives. And you know that because they got one of the most prized achievements that a human can get, which is, I don't know if you can tell, that's Alfred Noble. That's Alfred Noble on a coin, and that's Nobel Prize. So uh, who here has won a Nobel Prize? But if you did, it'd probably be pretty sweet, right? I would be really impressed. I'd want to talk to you. Okay, so um, Fritz Haber, uh, if anybody knows him, he won the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research in uh, nitrogen fixing. And the reason why Fritz Haber needed to do nitrogen fixing is because there was a blockade from South America of guano coming into Germany. Because Germany was taking all that bat crap and turning it into bat boom. They were turning poop into bombs because that's where you get nitrogen from, and nitrogen is an important component in bombs. Uh, Fritz Haber's genius was to say, oh my god, the air is mostly nitrogen, and if we can fix the nitrogen from the air and turn it into something that we can use in explosives, we could basically turn, uh, create explosives from thin air. And he did that. And you'd think that that wouldn't have earned him a Nobel Prize, but because of the third point of Foucault's uh, uh, quote, which is you, you never really know what the outcome of what you're going to do is, he happened to feed a hungry planet. World War II, industrialization was happening. Uh, polio was uh, uh, eradicated, basically. Tons of more people were surviving uh, the first five years of their life, and we had an explosion in population that we couldn't really feed unless Fritz Haber fixed nitrogen and was able to uh, create a lot of uh, fertile ground for, or fertilizer for our plants to feed a hungry planet. So he won the Nobel Prize, and I'm sure if he was here, uh, it would be really exciting to talk to him, even though he has a really twisted and dark life, including making uh, chemical warfare, and some, somehow, uh, one of the stories that I know about him is, like, his wife shot herself uh, because she was so disappointed in him. She couldn't shoot, she couldn't, she couldn't bring it to herself to shoot him, so she shot herself. And uh, he was like, oh, man, my wife is bleeding to death, but I, I really need to go see if the chemical weapons that I made are working. So he went out to the front lines that same day as his wife was bleeding to death, basically. And he was like, yep, chemical weapons work real good. They look at them, str like, struggling to breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> anyway, so Fritz Haber is one messed up dude. He still wanted to know about prize after doing that. After. Yes, people knew, and they gave him that gold little coin thing. I, can't I couldn't believe it. Anyway, so now we got uh, this guy. Look at the sweet cutie face. His name is uh, Antonio Igas Monitz. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. But he was a sweetheart, and we know this because of his journals. Um, his journals were full of little descriptions about how much he cared about his patients and how much he was really sad to see them struggling. He was a psychologist back in the day, basically. And... Uh, he realized that if he just disrupts some of uh, the brain using a delicate procedure in which you remove a tiny portion of the skull and squiggle it around with a popsicle stick, they actually calmed down. And so he figured out this one, uh, one uh, simple trick to help really d like deranged and uh, mentally disturbed patients actually have a, a life of uh, sanity or, or partial sanity. And it was supposed to be used in the most extreme of cases because you literally had to remove a portion of the skull. His uh, protege basically figures out this thing where if you put your fingers right over here, you'll feel a tear duct. It's like this um, little gap in your eye socket. 
And he's like, oh my god, we don't need to cut the skull open anymore. We can just shove an ice pick through people's eyeballs, right? And this is so much simpler. Yeah, yeah, you should you could feel it. If you shove an ice pick over there, it's uh it's one step closer to your um, DIY at home lobotomy. <clears throat> Please do not try this at home. Uh, but he tried it all over the country. World War II ended, and it's just a matter of the timing of it that a bunch of people were coming home from the trenches, totally disturbed because of the uh, the, the toxic gases that Haber made. And so this, these stories are kind of like intertwined. It's pretty crazy. And they're like, oh my God, the world is so awful. I can't believe this Haber guy, his wife shot herself, and then he still went out to the trenches. And so they're really, really upset and traumatized. So it's post-traumatic stress, right? And so I think this guy's name was William something or another. Anyway, Mornitz's protege goes around with, an, uh, with ice picks and then does a road show. There are pictures of him doing two lobotomies simultaneously, left and right handed, through people's um, tear ducts because their children were not paying attention in class. It's like the, the early um, Ritalin uh, was an ice pick through the face. And so this guy, guess what else he got? Uh, Monitz got the Nobel Prize too. And it's all about that third clause in Foucault's statement. You never know what you're going to do is going to do. And so if we're going to talk about um, Fritz Haber uh, real quick and see the, just how this, this cookie continues to crumble, all that nitrogen that he fixed is now running into the Gulf of Mexico and creating giant plumes of life or death. I'll leave it up to you to Wikipedia later. Okay, sorry, guys. <laughs> Thank you for being such a, a great audience. Um, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to go from there to talk about how this, uh, these questions are still coming up for me in my work. And uh, after that time, I started really questioning what is the purpose of all this open source and all this hacker stuff that I've been doing. What do I really want to do? And initially, I thought I wanted to continue down the line of trying to uh, address global challenges with these, uh, these approaches. And so I participated in POC. I went to uh, Egypt. Uh, sorry, this is uh, Lebanon where there was a trash crisis, and I started trying to figure out how to address um, some of the, the, uh, the problems with trash, with DIY solutions, and uh, that's unintended consequence. And then the last thing that I did was my most recent experiment, which is I decided that I didn't really understand my own intentions because I was coming in from afar. I was kind of dropping in being like, oh man, like global challenges are a problem. Let's use some of these tools that I know about and that you know, I have in my circles to try to address them. And then I thought, like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. In order for me to feel authentic about my creativity and about my, like, generosity, I need to make friends with people. So this is um, a bunch of, I think this is all Syrian, Syrian refugees, but this is a bunch of Syrian refugees at an organization, and we were doing a design thinking workshop. Okay, so design thinking, if anybody knows, is uh, part of this whole line of research into human-centered design, trying to talk to people about their lives to derive the solutions that you create. Rather than sitting there being like, oh, I got an Arduino, what can I make? It's talking to people and then deciding from there what to produce. And so a lot of the global NGOs and uh, semi-governmental organizations have this problem with a bunch of refugees coming to their country, um, a bunch of problems in their country from trash to electricity to water, and they're wondering how could they combine this uh, natural resource of human brains and the unnatural challenges of uh, garbage in the streets to encourage people to start projects to address some of those challenges and they thought that the best way to do it is to encourage uh, pro like projects from the youth that don't have jobs and to fund them and to teach them design processes and I did that. I did that for a year and uh, at some point I just started not really uh, seeing returns I guess. I, I felt like we were using so much resources and the outputs were so limited and that the, uh, the most that we were doing was actually creating a safe space for them to make friends with each other. And that was actually, first of all, that's really cool, okay? That in and of itself is a really awesome thing to do. And at the end, I just started wondering what I was doing with all of my work. And I decided that I missed what brought me to this place to begin with, which is my own personal creativity and excitement and energy. And so, uh, although I went first from, from that to, hey, I have to share this idea of like a sense of agency and capacity to the tools um, creating solutions to me um, directly doing this uh, sort of research and sharing to finally being like, wait, you know what? Maybe I should just go back and uh, start making stuff that is really fun. So I started working on some 
natural language processing projects. And also, I think I found uh, one, one clever trick to combine these two. So I started a small project with my friend called Pitchworthy, where I get to do the designing and the programming and the development and manage a team, and it's really fun, but the outputs of it um, are connected to this sort of uh, mindset and process of encouraging people to continue to start projects. And that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I actually wanted to, hopefully I did that quickly, and that we still have, yeah, yeah it's like 17 minutes, shoot, son. So we have a bunch of time, and I want to see where people are at. I want to get feedback first on, on some of the, the things that I just shared and like uh, some of the challenges that I talked about and some of the ways that I went about uh, resolving those and see also where people are in their lives and some of the ways that they've tried to do good and maybe some of their doubts, if you'd be willing to share. We can even turn off the microphone. I'm sorry, streamers. It's going to get personal, so you got to look away. All right. Oh, man, I'm weird. Okay, so... Um, if anybody is willing, I'm going to say that we'll, we'll get into this little circle and uh, have a discussion on some of these topics. Uh, uh, first of all, like quick intros, like where do you come from? What have you been up to? What colors do you like? Okay.